Okay, we're going to solve another system of differential equations. So this one is written in matrix form, uh, but we have a two-dimensional system, linear homogeneous equations with constant coefficients. So this is the kind we can use eigenvalues and eigenvectors to solve. This one will have non-real eigenvalues, and you wouldn't necessarily know that until you get into the problem. But that's the point of this example is to do another example that has some non-real eigenvalues. All right, so you want to first of all start by finding the eigenvalues. So however you know to do that. So this is how our textbook does it. A minus lambda i and then we're going to take the determinant of that and set the determinant equal to zero. So let's see, we'll have zero equals negative four minus lambda times two minus lambda plus 12. And we're going to be really careful when we multiply this all out, because this is a place that is common for mistakes. Uh, so on my lambda term here, I'll have a plus four lambda and a minus two lambda, so plus two lambda. And then I will have a minus eight and a plus 12, so plus four. All right, this one does not factor, so I'm gonna use quadratic formula. So negative two plus or minus the square root of b squared, so two squared is four, minus four ac, so minus 16 all over two a. So this square root of four minus 16 is where I get my imaginary numbers from. That's square root of negative 12, which is 2i square root of 3. Uh, and then simplifying with my 2 here, that is a denominator of both those terms on the numerator. So I get lambda equals negative 1 plus or minus i times square root 3. Okay, so non-real eigenvalues. So from here, I need to think about how I'm going to proceed with that. Um, so be sure that you look back at our notes. We have some things written in our notes about how to handle this, but essentially, just like when we did non-real zeros for the characteristic polynomial, you're going to end up with some exponential functions that are going to involve e to the negative t, and you're going to end up with some trig functions that are going to involve cosine of square root of 3t and sine of square root of 3t. So this connects back to what we did with those non-real zeros of the characteristic polynomial. But before I get to that part, I need to think about the null space of the matrix. And so I've got really two different eigenvalues here, but the uh, eigenvectors for those two different ones will actually be conjugates of each other. So for the non-real eigenvalues, you really only have to do one of them, and then you can use the conjugates to find your other eigenvectors. So for the method that we use in our textbook, and to use the formulas that are in our textbook, you will want to use the one with the plus. You can use the one with the minus, but then there are some sign changes in some places in, your, uh, in, in the later steps. So you just have to be careful about that and think that through. So I'm going to use the one with the plus here. So I'm going to put in lambda equals negative 1 plus i times square root of 3 into my a minus lambda i matrix. Again, being careful with all of your subtractions. So I'm going to have negative 4 minus all of this. So for the real part, I'll have negative 4 minus negative 1. So negative 4 plus 1, negative 3. And then remember, I'm minusing this whole lambda, so it'll be minus this second term here. So minus i times square root of 3. And then here's the 6 and negative 2. And then 2 minus my lambda. So 2 minus negative 1 will be 2 plus 1. And then minus the i square root of 3. OK, and when we had real numbers that we plugged in here, the next thing we did was find a basis for the null space of this matrix. And so for some of those problems, I wrote down the definition of the null space, the set of all vectors such that this matrix times the vector is the zero vector. But then later, I kind of just went straight to the system of equations that you would get from doing that. So I'm going to do that part here. 
Uh, so the system of equations I would get is negative 3 minus i times square root of 3 times a plus 6b is equal to 0 uh, for the first equation, first row, and then negative 2a plus 3 minus i square root of 3b is equal to 0. When we did these for real eigenvalues, it was pretty obvious that we had the same equation twice. So the question is, is this the same equation twice? It actually is. It's a little bit harder to see that. But if you want to check that it is, you could multiply the first equation through by something and the second equation through by something to force the coefficients of the same terms to be the same. And then you should be able to verify the coefficients of the other terms are the same. So for example, if I wanted to multiply this first equation through by 3 minus i times square root of 3, and the second equation through by 6, that would force my b terms to be the same. And of course, the right-hand side would be 0. And then I should be able to see when I do that that my a terms are also the same as well. So it should be the same equation twice. If you want to verify that, you can. If you're pressed for time, like on an exam, I don't know that I would take the time to do that. Um, but that should be the same equation twice, just like when we did it with real eigenvalues. And so what you're looking for is a, b values, non-zero a, b values that make these equations true. So again, you kind of just, you have a choice about how you do this. I usually just pick one of the equations and move some terms from one side to the other so that I can uh, easily choose a and b values that make that equation true. So I might take this first one, and just to make the signs a little bit easier, I might add this term involving a, this combination of terms, I guess, involving a to both sides of the equation. So I end up with 6b equals positive 3 plus i times square root of 3a. And so what I'm looking for, a, b values that make that equation true. And so I'm just going to choose the a's and b's to be kind of the opposite of what I see on the other side of the equation. So if I choose a to be 6 and then b to be 3 plus i square root of 3, both sides are 6 times 3 plus i square root of 3. There's lots more choices you could choose there, but that's pretty straightforward, easy way to do that. All right, uh, so that is an eigenvector for this eigenvalue. Uh, eigenvectors for the conjugate would be the conjugate of that. So if you happen to choose the negative 1 minus i square root of 3, uh, you would end up with the conjugate here. So the same, first, the same real part, but a minus in that second entry there. Um, but I don't really need to do that. So when we talked, you might look back at your notes for this, but when we talked about finding the solutions to the differential equation, I need two linearly independent solutions to build the solution space for this system of differential equations. So I can get those by taking the real and the imaginary parts of this vector times e to this value times t. So uh, we're going to kind of, I'm going to shorten a little bit of that work here, but the idea is I'm going to take my eigenvector here, 6 and 3 plus i square root of 3, and then I'm going to take that times e to this number times t. And so just like we did before when we had complex values, we talked about what does it mean to raise e to an imaginary number, and that's where those trig functions come in. That's that Euler's equation. So I'll have e to the negative 1t for the real part, and then times cosine square root 3t plus i times sine square root 3t. Right, this is the definition of what it means to have e to an imaginary number it's cosine of that number plus i times sine of that number, uh, the b. Um, all right, so what I need to do now is separate this into the real and imaginary parts of this expression. So the more of these you do, the more you will maybe go quickly through some of this algebra here, um, but you don't want to mess it up. So if you have to write out more steps, you have to write out more steps. I tend to like, I, I tend to lose my e to the negative t if I'm not careful. So I tend to like to put that out front 
and then I can just focus on all of these terms involving the eyes here. Um, so it is also dangerous to put it out front because if you don't remember to look there, you can still lose it. So that's a caution, I guess. I know that kind of my own work habits are that I sometimes accidentally drop that. I know it should be there if I look back here. So sometimes I can recover from that mistake, but uh, all right, and then I'm going to go ahead and distribute my 6 through here. So 6 cosine square root 3t plus i times 6 sine square root 3t. And then on this bottom one where I've got two terms, the I'm going to use distributive property here, and I'm going to be kind of strategic about how I do that so that I've got some terms in a convenient order. All right, so I'm going to take my 3 times the cosine square root 3t. All right, and then uh, if I just do my first term times my last one here, that's going to be an imaginary term. And then I'll also get an imaginary term from my i square root 3 times the cosine square root 3t. I kind of want to rearrange this so I have all the real terms together and all the imaginary terms together. And so when I take this i square root of 3 times the i sine of square root of 3t, remember i times i, i squared is negative 1. So that will become a real term. i times i, i squared is negative 1. So I'll end up with a negative 1 times square root of 3, so minus square root of 3, and then sine square root of 3t. All right, so those are my real terms when I foil out all this on the bottom. And then I'm going to have some imaginary terms. And so I just arranged my terms so that I've got the real ones together and the imaginary ones together. Uh, so for the imaginary terms, one of those will come from my 3 times the i sine square root 3t. And then another one will come from my i times square root of 3 times the cosine square root of 3t. This step will take up probably the whole width of your paper when you do this step on your notebook paper there. All right. Okay. But the idea here is that then when I take the real and the imaginary parts of this expression, that gives me my two linearly independent solutions that I need to build the general solution. So sometimes I actually skip this step that I wrote here and I go straight to separating that into the real and the imaginary parts. So as you do a few more problems, you might find that you also are able to skip this step. It's not worth skipping if you're going to mess it up though. All right, so one of my solutions, I don't want to lose my e to the negative t that should be out front of both of these, is the real terms here. So the real terms, because of the way I organized it, are these first terms here. Oops, square root 3t. And then in the second entry, 3 cosine square root 3t minus square root 3 sine square root 3t. Okay, so that's one of my two linearly independent solutions that I need to build my general solution. I'll write the other one over here in a second color here. So my x2 is going to be the imaginary part. Again, don't lose your e to the negative t. That's in front of both of these. Okay, so it's just the imaginary part. So not really the i, just the parts that are times the i's. So 6 sine square root 3t and then 3 sine square root 3t plus square root 3 cosine square root 3t. Okay, so there I have two solutions to my system of differential equations. You can verify that they're linearly independent. Since I have only two of them, it's pretty easy to do that. One is not a scalar multiple of the other. Uh, and so then I can use those to build my general solution. I'm not going to write all that out just because of space here. But then your general solution will be x equals c1 times one of these. I'll just write x1 here. 
that you'd write all that there, plus C2 times the second one. Okay, so no one step in here is hard. There's a bunch of algebra and a bunch of multiplying things out and solving systems of equations. No step in here is hard, but it's easy to make a little sign error somewhere and uh, mess that up. So I guess my biggest piece of advice is just be careful with the algebra. Um, the other place I sometimes see students make mistakes is they'll, they'll put this I in here. But really what's happening, and this is in our textbook in our notes, is that you're taking linear combinations of these imaginary ones and dividing through by a convenient coefficient. You want things that are real valued functions that satisfies your original differential equation that do not, does not have imaginary numbers in this original differential equation. So you should not expect to have imaginary numbers here in your solutions. Sort of went into this imaginary number world for a little bit to help us manipulate the equations, but the solutions should involve real number inputs, real number outputs, or, or maybe vector outputs here. So, All right, so uh, again, not hard, but a lot of places to make mistakes. So just slow down, be careful. Don't get frustrated with yourself if you make a sign error. Just think about how you could maybe avoid doing that on the next problem.